Take your Bible, turn with me to the book of Luke chapter number four. Luke chapter number four. And uh, continue our journey through the book of Luke. If you remember last week, all the temptation in the wilderness, the tempter came and uh, told him, take those stone and uh, make it into bread. And uh, Jesus responded in a great truth, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And a great truth, he showed us he needed bread, but start with the spiritual, get that spiritual bread first, the word of God. Now, you go through here, Jesus goes to the city of Capernaum. And as he goes to Capernaum, begins to teach in the synagogue, and he began to give his word, uh, speak words. And his word uh, was filled with doctrine. His word was filled with power. His word was filled with authority. It was filled with sometimes reproof. And he's in the synagogue. And then uh, a man that was possessed with a devil came unto him and began to uh, sort of say some words to Jesus. Let us alone. What have we to do with thee? And Jesus rebuked the devil and the demon came out. Praise the Lord for that. And there was these bystanders who were watching what was going on and they were amazed, amazed at his word. And they said the term, what a word is this? What a word is this? That's gonna be the title of the message. Before we get to the message though, you know, words can be used for good and words can be used for evil, bad. And uh, boy, this uh, week, uh, getting that chapel, the fellowship hall ready for that ladies meeting on Wednesday, went to the paint store and, uh, you know, we spent a lot of money on some paint and the, the man there was just not happy about something and some words, some mumblings. And I remember going out of there and, you know, his negative words and attitude right there. I told Joseph, I don't ever want to buy paint. I don't want to spend a lot of money with somebody who's got a bad attitude. And he was using his words not for good, but for bad. Have you ever had that happen to you? And uh, in truth, we've all been on that other end where we've used those words not for good. Have we not? Yes, and then you can use your words for good. I was reading a book about B.H. Carroll, a prominent Baptist from the past, and uh, back in World, uh, World War, no, Civil War, back in the Civil War, he had uh, joined the army, and he was an infidel, meaning he was an unbeliever. And uh, he got wounded in the Civil War, went back home, became a school teacher, walked with a limp, and boy, he, he just had a, a really a bad attitude, was very anti-God, anti-Christ, very smart, uh, but he was invited to a revival and he went the first night and the preacher preached and he went again and he went again. And at the end of one of the sermons, the preacher came down and he said, I wanna talk to you folks out there that are unbelievers. I wanna talk to you folks that are infidels. He said, the Bible says in John chapter number seven, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. And then he encouraged, he said, listen, you may not be saved now, but just start doing his will. And God will show you very quickly that his will, he is God, he is the way, he is the truth. And uh, boy, uh, B.H. Carroll began to walk the aisle, not to get saved, but he was making a commitment to try to do his will to figure things out. And people got excited. Uh, but a few days later, after trying to do his will, boy, God opened the door and he trusted Christ. Uh, words can be used for good. Words can be used for evil. Let's do this. Let's stand for the reading of God's word. We're going to read here Luke chapter number four, starting in verse 31. And we're going to go through verse 37. What I'll do is I'll read verse number 31 and we'll do every other verse, starting in verse 31. And came down to Capernaum a city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath days. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. And in the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil, and cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone, what have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace, and come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him and hurt him not. And they were all amazed and spake among themselves, saying, What a word is this? For with authority and power he commanded the unclean spirits, and they come out. 
and the fame of him went out into every place of the country round about. And in verse 36, they were amazed, and they begin to say, what a word is this? What a word is this? Say that, say that phrase with me one time. What a word is this? Boy, Jesus' word, filled with doctrine, filled with power, filled with authority, filled with rebuke, and they got there and they're listening to it, they're amazed. What a word is this? That's the title. Before we go any further, let's stop, bow our heads, go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we do love you. And uh, in reality, we love you because you first loved us. Thank you for coming 2,000 years ago, born of a virgin, living a perfect life, and giving us the gift of eternal life. Boy, thinking back to that time, uh, oh, the, the devil being cast out of that man, and your word of authority, your word with power, your word with rebuke, your word with doctrine. And uh, truly, what a word is this? And I pray that you help us to think about your words and then help us to stand in awe of your word. We love you. Lord, if there's a soul here this morning that's not saved, I pray that it be saved. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Oh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you imagine you know, what would have it been like to be in that little city on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee when Jesus came to town, going to the synagogue? Boy, I would have, I believe I would have loved to have gathered around and to listen to his voice, listen to his word, listen to what he had to say. And you can imagine him, spake with power, spake with authority, spake uh, words filled with doctrine, with rebuke and Boy, to watch that, they were amazed. And we think about, uh, as the Bible says, never a man spake like this man. And uh, Jesus, God in the flesh, Jesus is the word. Jesus is the word. By the way, I use a Bible program. Sometimes it's called Lagos or Logos. And uh, it's very interesting. The word Logos is in the Greek. It means the word. And uh, supposedly with the, the student software program right there, you're able to study God's word better. But Jesus is the word of God. Take your Bible, if you will. You're gonna hold your place there in Luke chapter four, but go to John chapter number one. John chapter number one, a well-known passage of scripture. John chapter number one, verse number one. The Bible says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Now, I'm gonna slow it down a little bit. I'm gonna read that verse again. In the beginning was the word, and the Word was with God and the word. word was God. Then it continues, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. And then you go a little bit further to verse number 14. Look at verse 14, John 1, 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is the Word, the Word is God, and uh, the Word became flesh to dwelt among us. Now think about that, Jesus is the Word. You, you find this throughout the scriptures, you can go through scripture after scripture. First John chapter five, verse seven says it like this, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. You'll, you'll find this uh, saying that Jesus is the word in places like Luke chapter one, verse two. Even as they delivered unto him, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. They were ministers of the Lord Jesus Christ. You find it in 2 Peter chapter three, verse five. For, for this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old. The word of God, Jesus, the heavens were old. He created the heavens of old. He is the creator. You, you find that in Acts chapter 20, verse 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. And you think about with me the expression, the word. Jesus is the word. It's a very interesting one, is it not? And you know, you find it in John uh, chapter number one. It signifies that Jesus, or the word is a person, and without a doubt, Jesus uh, became flesh, the word became flesh to dwell and dwelt among us. And it seems to be a term that was very familiar with the, the Jews, and it's almost undeniable that it was noticed by them. 
but, but why that phrase, Jesus, the word is used, why didn't he use the Son of God or something to that extent? You know, some would say uh, because that Christ is called the word because he's the wisdom of God. Uh, some would say, well, Christ is called the word because he's the image and offspring of the Father's mind. They'll quote Hebrews chapter one, verse three, where it says, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person. And uh, bear with me for a second. Some would say, well, Christ is called the word because he is the person who is spoken about in all the Old Testament promises and he's the subject of their prophecies. And then some would even say, well, he's called the word. Jesus is the word because he is the speaker, the utter, the interpreter of the will of God. And they would quote Hebrews chapter one, where it says, God who, uh, God who at sundry time in his diverse manners spake in God, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last times spoken unto us by his son. Now, no matter what your thought on that, in reality, I don't know why God told us uh, that he's the word, he just is the word. I don't have full understanding of that. But one thing I knew, I, and I know, one thing I know, what a word is this? Okay, one thing I understand. I don't understand it all, but I know what a word is this. What a word is Jesus, amen. Now, if I don't get another halfway little teeny weeny amen, we got one from Brother Randy, and I got one from, I don't know, somebody over there. I appreciate that, but what a word is this? That makes the sermon shorter, I believe. And so, what a word is this? The story. Uh, Jesus goes to Capernaum, you know, after the temptation in the wilderness. And boy, that little town, much history in the city of Capernaum there. And, you know, Peter was from Capernaum. And boy, the, uh, the remember they, they had this uh, lame man or that man uh, they brought and put him down uh, through the, the roof of the house. Remember, that was in Capernaum. And there was a centurion in Capernaum. We know a lot about Capernaum. And here he is in Capernaum. He goes to the synagogue that's in Capernaum. And he begins to speak. And when he spake, oh my, doctrine. Uh, when he spake, authority. When he spake, uh, power. Uh, when he spake, rebuke. And I, I already said it, but I just want to say it again. I, I hope that I went, when, when if I would live back in that time, that I would go around and I would hear him speak. You know, I would hope that I'd get there and I'd say, I wouldn't say, Jesus, are you, are you done already? Uh, are you about done? I, I've been here, you know, 30 minutes now. I hope I wouldn't do that. I hope it, give me more, give me more. I, I would hope that it, his authority wouldn't bother me. I hope that his power in his preaching wouldn't upset me. I would hope that his rebuke would not uh, make me mad at him. I, I, I pray that I would stand amazed at his word. I would sit there, what a word is this? Now look back at that verse there with me in verse number uh, 32. Look at this, what a word is this? Verse 32, and they were astonished at his doctrine. And that's interesting, his word was filled with doctrine. I want to say that again. His word was filled with doctrine. And we, we think about doctrine. Doctrine is really a, a set of beliefs that you get some from somewhere. You know, there is many different science. There's chemist doctrine of chemistry you can get from a chemistry book. There's uh, some math doctrine. There's all sorts of, but we're speaking of biblical doctrine. The best doctrine is God. God gives us what we should believe found in the Word of God. And as you systematically study the Word of God, God has a lot to say about angels, the doctrine of angels. God has a lot to say about the plan of salvation. How do you go to heaven? The doctrine of, of salvation, the doctrine of hell, the doctrine of heaven, the doctrine of, of eternal life. And really, you think about praise God for God's Word being filled with doctrine, a form of what you believe. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 2 for I give you good doctrine. There's good doctrine. There's certainly bad doctrine. Matthew chapter number seven, uh, they were astonished at his doctrine. Ephesians chapter four says uh, to be careful. To, there's a group of people tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. First Timothy chapter four, it tells us give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to good doctrine. Some people would uh, say, they say, well, pastor, you just don't understand you don't want a church that built on doctrine. Because let me just be frank with you, Pastor. You know, too much doctrine. Doc doctrine divides 
and love unites. We want a church that's more about love rather than doctrine because we don't want the divisiveness of doctrine. And by the way, they, they are correct. Doctrine does indeed divide and love does unite, but, but doctrine divides right from wrong. Uh, doctrine divides light from darkness. Doctrine divides fact from fiction. Doctrine drives truth from error. And uh, one of the groups of soul owners, I think this Thursday, you and Matthew went out, Brother Chris, and uh, he was telling me, he said, you ran into a guy and uh, he, they, Matthew was giving the gospel to somebody. And you know, uh, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And as our Sunday school lesson this morning, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And it gave him that. And then at the end, a guy had been listening in and he got all wound up. And he began, that's not right. And uh, Matthew said, well, let me just show you what the Bible says. By the way, that's a great, do the doctrines of the Bible. The, what does the Bible say? And that's what we are. We're Bible believers. Jesus uh, gave us good doctrine. His speech was filled with good doctrine. What a word is this? Say that with me once. What a word is this? Then we go on a little bit further. Look at uh, verse 32. And they were astonished at his doctrine. Then it says, for his word was filled with power. <laughs> Word was filled with power. You, you think about that word power. It's a force, a strength, something that it's an energy that moves. And we already know, you know, Jesus is the word. And in Hebrews chapter four, verse 12, it says, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So, so Jesus' word was filled not with just doctrine, but, but his word was filled with power. Okay, some of you don't understand that, but I'll, I'll give you an illustration my dad's watching this morning. Hello, Dad. And uh, Dad, you remember Council Bluffs way, way back then? Yeah, uh, well, it was probably nine or uh, ten maybe at the time. But my next door neighbor came back around the 4th of July with a bag of firecrackers. Now, you know, you think about dynamite. And little firecrackers are like little pieces of dynamite. And he gave them to me. And uh, he said, here's how you do it. You light these things right there and then you throw them and then boom. And so, man, you know, a 10-year-old kid, whoo, uh, I got me a bag of little dynamites right there and whoop, like this, throw them like that, boom. And, you know, I did a few of those. You remember this, Dad. And my dad came home, and I had that bag of those little dynamite things right there, and I said, Dad, watch this. And whoop, throw like boom. And I, I just saw my, I remember it, Dad. You may not remember it, but I remember it, Dad. You, you gave me that look like I'm going to blow my hand off. And because those little things, if I was not careful, boom, right in my hand, I could hurt myself pretty bad. And uh, those little, uh, little things, sticks of dynamite are powerful. Okay, some of you still don't go, so I'm gonna go a little bit lower on the bottom shelf to help you understand power. And uh, this, this will help you, okay? Some of you need a little bit better of an illustration. My little Amos, he's one and a half, going a little, almost two. And uh, little Amos, you know, he came, came into my office yesterday. And I've got some tools, I get these, they're like magnetic strips and I'll hang my tool way up high. And you know, sometimes the magnetic strip, it doesn't hold those tools very well. And I have a little hammer and somehow that little hammer landed on the floor and Amos, sometimes he'll come into my office and he knows, he knows that he shouldn't touch something but he'll get it and he'll hold it. And he, he was holding that little hammer, just a little hammer and he just smiles at me. It's like, I got you dad, I got you. And I said, no, no Amos, give me that thing and hammer. And so I took the hammer from him and the big poochie lip came out. Now, I wasn't a very good dad because a good dad would put the hammer back up here. I didn't do that. I just sort of set it on my, my dress or my desk right there. And next thing you know, you know, he somehow snuck that little hammer. And it may seem like a little hammer, but that hammer is powerful. And that hammer has the potential to destroy. Well, it doesn't have the potential to destroy because a few minutes later, uh, somebody was getting onto Amos in the living room, probably banging on some walls and some furniture. That little hammer had power. And uh, you think about the Lord Jesus Christ, his word had doctrine, his word had power. And what a word is this? What a word is this? What a word is this? Okay, 
I'm going to buy little hammers for all the parents in here that have little kids. I'm going to give those out next week so you understand this illustration better. And uh, what a word is this. Go back with me, if you will, to verse number 35. 35. And it says right here in verse 35, And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And you see Jesus' word not only had doctrine, not only had power, but, but Jesus' words also had rebuke. Do you understand that? Had rebuke. In other words, he, he chided that devil. He, he reproved that devil. He was basically chastening that devil in some way. And, and Jesus rebuked the man possessed with the devil. And you know, in, in second, or 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, preach the word. Remember that? Preach the word. And then it says, be instant in season, out of season, reprove rebuke uh, and exhort with all long suffering and there the word doctrine. And so Jesus' word did have doctrine, it had power, but also his words uh, were rebuking words. Now to help you understand this, I remember, oh, years ago, there was a, a good man, but doing some things that were not right. And I remember as a pastor, I just needed to talk to him about it. I needed to, to rebuke him and say, hey, knock it off. And I went to that man and uh, very frank with him, I said, you can't be doing this. And I was kind, of course, we restore such one in the spirit, spirit of meekness, but it was rebuking words. You can't do this. It's bad, not just for you, but it's bad for the people around you. And, and praise God, that man had a humble spirit. He said, hey, pastor, you're right. And then knocked it off. And it took a, a terrible situation and turned it into something glorious. But there is a time to rebuke. There is a time to say, hey, this is wrong. There is a time for the word of God as we read it to rebuke us. You think about the people reading through the New Testament. I you know, read the New Testament this month, but there is some encouragement in the New Testament, praise the Lord. But there is points in the New Testament this month as I read them that rebuked me, that said, hey, Pastor Matt, and God doesn't call me pastor, you know, but the Bible says, you know, points to me, but hey, knock it off, uh, get right. And how do we approach the rebuke of the words of Christ? Hey, we think about the rebuke of God's word. What a word is this? Words filled with doctrine, words filled with power, words filled with rebuke. Look at this next one, if you will. And uh, look with me at verse number 36. This is so interesting. And they were all amazed and spake among themselves saying, what a word is this, say that phrase with me, what a word is this, then he describes it, for with authority and power, he commanded the unclean spirits and they come out. Authority, power that should be submitted to. And uh, the words of Jesus was, has power, but they, they have authority that should be submitted to. And so his words had authority, authority from on high. He is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And the words found in the Bible right here are words of authority, something that we should submit to. I remember, oh, I was 19 years of age. Now, you know, I didn't, at 19, I didn't, I didn't like following any rules. And so I did what every 19 year old who doesn't like rules should do. I joined the Navy to get away from the rules. That's what I did, yeah. No more rules, I was in the Navy. And so I got to boot camp and I went to Orlando to boot camp in, uh, boy, that was December. And in boot camp, 1993, uh, boy, they're so nice to you when you first get there. Oh, we love having you here. They keep you up till like one in the morning. And that's what they did. They kept you and they put you in this room. They said, go to bed, have a good night's sleep. And then it was like four or five in the morning, some man began to yell and scream and threw a trash can down the middle of the barracks right there. And he said, everybody on the line! And I don't know, I scared me half to death. I jumped out of there. I don't even think I jumped. I think I just leaped out of there and landed on the ground right there and I got on the line. And you know, he had authority. And I needed to submit to that authority, those rules. Hey, Jesus spoke with authority, and it's something that the people, you and I, should certainly submit to his authority. I think there was one brother, Randy, that didn't jump out of that bed. He was sleeping the whole, I think it was you. I think that's what that was right there. I don't know, he looked like you. That short hair like that, praise the Lord. Uh, but now, now stop with me. The sermon, we're, we're getting there. We're getting somewhere. Jesus' words, filled with doctrine, Jesus' words filled with power. Jesus' words filled with rebuke. 
Jesus' words filled with authority. You can see him. What a word is this. But, but look at this. Look, look back with me at that verse 36. And they were all amazed. They were all amazed and spake among themselves, saying, what a word is this. In other words, they, they amazed. They were astonished. They were confounded. There was some fear inside of them, the fear of the Lord, uh, some surprise, some wonder. Um, there's a verse in Psalm 119 that describes it very clear. Psalm 119, verse 16, it says, but my heart standeth in awe of thy word. In other words, wow. You know, they, 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 they looked at the word of the Lord Jesus Christ, the doctrine, the power, the, the rebuke, and the authority, and, and there was uh, some awe to it. There was an awe of the word. There was some wonder. There was some fear. There was some amazement. It was awesome. It was wonderful. It was amazing. Amazed. They used the word amazed, right? You understand that? Okay, good. Now, there's a problem, though, because you, you think this is where it goes for you and me. How would you have responded to the words of Christ? Would have you been amazed? Would have you stood in awe of his word? Now, I like to think I would, but we fast forward today. Here's where we're getting. We're, we're just slowly coming in here. We, we, can have, we can think back to what we would have done 2,000 years ago, but what do we do today with his word? Because this book is filled with doctrine, this book is filled with power. This book is filled with rebuke. This book is filled with authority. And how do we stand in front of this book? This is the words of the Lord. He is the word. Jesus is the word. Um, there's a problem because today there's sort of a, a, an issue, a little what I call sort of shock value. You have TV, the shock value of commercials, uh, you have YouTube and Facebook and TikTok and Instagram. And, you know, there's probably a new one that I don't even know about that's for the new people that they're way ahead of me and all that stuff. But there's so much on there that has shock and awe that all of a sudden, sometimes we're not careful. We get to this book and, yeah, we know it's filled with doctrine. We know it's, we know it's filled with power. It's the word of God. We know it's filled with rebuke. Uh, we know it's filled with authority, but we don't stand amazed at the word of God. You know, we don't, uh, you know, we don't stand in awe of his word. For, for example, you know, earlier we were talking about the word. Remember, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was with God. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Then we got to verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And then we went to John chapter five, verse seven, uh, the father, the word, and the spirit, these three are one. And then we went over to, to Luke chapter one, verse two. And then we went over to, uh, oh, to second Peter chapter three, verse five. And you know, if I'm careful, we just like, oh. You know, we don't stand, we're sore bored. We're not standing in awe of his word. And it's something, you know, we've gotta be careful of. B.H. Carroll, remember B.H. Carroll? The infidel, and boy, a great sermon to read. My infidelity and what became of it. What a, a neat sermon that he, he took his, his life story and, and preached a sermon. Uh, but B.H. Carroll, at a young age, started to read about 300 pages a day. And he read a book a day uh, for over 50 years. Biographies, the Bible he read from cover to cover over and over again. And I read his biography, and he was mentioning that that he's got to be careful of the newspapers of the day. Because he'd start reading the paper and he said, if I, if I read too many of the newspapers of the day, it begins to affect my ability to stand in awe, basically what he's saying, to stand in awe of God's word. Nothing wrong with a newspaper, but he was saying that sometimes those newspapers hindered him from saying, what a word is this? You know, and I was reading that, I was thinking, man, you know, a newspaper, what about us today? Once again, you know, we, we think about us. I believe sometimes today uh, we're deadened, you might say. I don't know if that's a good word. Or we hinder or hurt our ability to read and study God's word because of our consumption of things that hurt us. Our consumption of social media, 
our consumption of entertainment, our consumption of YouTube and Instagram, TikTok, Facebook. I don't think anybody reads a newspaper now. If you do, you're one of the few. Uh, but, but you understand our consumption of things that maybe not bad, maybe they are bad, but maybe not bad, begins to deaden us towards standing in awe of God's word and it hinders us from saying, what a word is this? So you have a choice. I have a choice, don't we? Now I want to get to the point where I never am deadened from standing in awe of God's word. I want to, I want to be able to read that New Testament and say, "Woo, man, what a word is this? I want to be able to do my daily Bible reading and I go, oh, I'm glad that's over. I want to be able to do my Bible and say, "Woo, man, praise God, did you see that truth found in the word of God? I don't even have to say it vocally, but inside my heart, rejoice and stand in awe of God's word. Now, think, just think with me. How, how about you? How have you done the last week? Have you stood in awe of God's word? Have you been able to say in your heart, what a word is this? And if not, why not? Good, good question. If you're not in awe of God's word, if you're not saying, what a word is this, why not? There's gotta be a reason why. And it very well could point to something you're consuming other than God's word, entertainment, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, etc. And you get to the point. Well, you get to the point, if we're not careful, we don't stand in awe of God's word. Uh, the preaching of God's, by the way, the preaching of God's word, same, the preaching of God's word is amazing. The preaching of God's word is, you know, coming to church and music, praise God for the music, but, but the preaching of God's word. Boy, the, the Sunday school, Sunday school is not meant to be boring when somebody teaches the word of God. It's glorious, it's wonderful. And how do we approach, do we stand in awe of that doctrine? Do we stand in awe of the rebuke of the authority and the power of God's word? Now, you, you think with me, go a little bit further. Um, you know, if you don't stand in awe of God's word, if you're not able to say, what a word is this? If you're, if you're, not, say, if you're not saved, your you're standing, your thought process toward the word of God can hinder you from being saved. Amen. Can it not? So you think about it, you go to somebody, Brother Chris, and you try to tell them, thus saith the Lord, look what the Bible says, and they have zero interest in the Bible. They have zero interest in the word of God, the doctrines of the Bible, they reject, they've hardened their heart toward that. All of a sudden, they, they don't trust Christ as their savior because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Boy, if you're here and you're not saved, oh, soften your heart toward thus saith the the Lord. By the way, uh, and you don't have, have that, what a word is this, it can hinder you from living for God. You know, boy, uh, living for Jesus, a life that is true, striving to please him in all that I do. I like that song, I should just keep singing, but I won't. <laughs> but think, think with me for a moment. When you are hardened toward the word of God, you don't stand in awe of his doctrine, of his rebuke, of his authority, of his power. All of a sudden you harden your heart and next thing you know, it hinders you from pleasing the Lord and living for the Lord. The last one, when you don't stand in awe of the, the word, when you don't say, what a word is this? Say that with me, what a word is it? We ought to practice saying that, what a word is this? But if you don't say that, if you don't have that awe in your mind, it can hinder you from receiving a blessing. I didn't quote it, but we think of the Psalm chapter one, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but the blessed man, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. Law of the Lord, his delight is in the law, his delight is in the law of the Lord. What is that? What a word is this? What is that? Standing in awe of the word. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. In other words, there's a blessing for standing in awe of his word. There's a blessing for saying, What a word is this? Okay, I'll help you. Brother, Brother Jordan, where are you at? I called you yesterday. Oh, yeah. And uh, you, you told me, you said, yeah, pastor, I'm going to get me some Domino's pizza. 
And man, I don't know, I, as a kid, I had a good friend that worked at Domino's and I'd get Domino's pizza when I was in high school quite a bit. But the Domino's today is a lot, I mean, I haven't had it for a long time, but it, it's good, it's good. And so he said that and I was hungry and I didn't say nothing. But a little bit later, I called brother Taylor Sosman. He's in school up in Chicago. And I said, hey, Taylor, how are you doing? He said, oh, doing good. School's not too hard. I got me a second job. I said, well, where are you working? What are you doing? He said, well, I'm delivering pizzas. I said, well, for what? For Domino's. And then he's delivering pizzas. And then he says, yeah, I get to eat pizza all I want. And they got this pasta and they got this. And he starts describing the Domino's pizza to the glory of God. And so all I could think was, man, Jordan, he's going to Domino's. I, I wonder if it's too late or not. So I said, Taylor, I got to go. I got to go. I got to call Jordan. He's going to go get some Domino's. So I hung up on him real quick. And uh, sorry for being rude to you, Brother Taylor. And called Jordan. And you were disgruntled slightly. I had to beg and I had to plead with you. But you had a lot of mercy. He said, Pastor, you want me to deliver it? I said, please, Jordan. So he went to Domino's yesterday. And, and as I, I got off the phone with you, Brother Jordan, my door was closed to my office. And all of a sudden, about three or four seconds after I got off the phone, all of a sudden my door opens like this and a sweet little girl begins to smile at me from ear to ear. And she said, pizza, daddy? She was listening in to all my conversation. <laughs> intentively saying, what a word is this? She stood in awe of the word of pizza. And uh, then she gathered around. She brought reinforcements. She went and got her brothers. And they all stood around me and began to smile at me. And so by the time you got over, 90% of my pizza was gone. Uh, you know, and so we went in there and we ate pizza. In other words, her listening in, listening intently to my word, standing in awe of my word, she received a blessing. When you and I say, what a word is this? When you and I stand in awe of the word of God, boy, there's big blessings with that. Huge blessings to that. You know, I want to stand in awe of God's word. I want to stand amazed, amazed like they did and say, what a word is this? Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we love you. Thank you for being so good to us. And uh, boy, giving us your word filled with doctrine, filled with power, filled with authority, filled with rebuke. I do pray that me personally, I do come to times when I do not read your Bible or approach it in awe or amazed. And I pray that when I notice that, I get right quickly and I have a good attitude. And Lord, I pray that you help me through the years to stand amazed in your presence, stand in awe of your word. And Lord, I do pray for the people that are here today. There's gonna be some that, woo, boy, this month, this week, they have stood in awe of your word, the preaching of your word, and they're receiving blessings. And God, I pray they continue down that path. But without a doubt, there are many who have probably been going to your word, even listening to the preaching of your word, but they've been sidetracked with something that's sort of deadened them toward enjoying or being amazed or saying, what a word is this? And I do pray, Lord, that you help them to go to you this morning, seek forgiveness, and then, Lord, I pray that you help to get them on that track of being all in awe of your word. Lord, if there's a soul here this morning that's not saved, I pray that you work on their hearts. I pray that they'd even be saved this morning. We love you. Please bless the invitation in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me. If